Drones have become one of the most feared, lethal, and destructive weapons of the modern battlefield. How did we go from using tiny quad rotor drones for simple aerial reconnaissance to essentially putting small cruise missiles in the hands of people who intuitively know how to use them from growing up playing video games? It seems like drones are constantly hovering above you, constantly watching, ready to call in artillery on your position drop munitions on you themselves, or even fall out of the sky screaming towards you. The history of how we got here might surprise you, and how drones are being used in the combat of today might surprise you even more. So, let's take a look at quad rotor drones on the modern battlefield. So, a couple disclaimers before we begin. Don't try to recreate anything you see in any of the footage that I share today. It is from an active war zone. All of the footage you see today was pulled from several different portions of the internet. I wish I could give credit to everyone whose footage I used, but since I'm using several hundred different videos that I've downloaded to use, I physically can't. So. I apologize that I'm not able to give credit to every single person who shared and uploaded this. All this footage comes from Reddit or Telegram. I will leave a link to the subreddits that I mainly pull this drone footage, combat footage from, so you can go and check it out at your leisure. Just be advised they're marked not safe for work for a reason. I don't recommend going and watching it if you don't want to, and everything I show today will be blurred when need be. Not just because I don't want you to mad at me, but I don't want you to see it if you don't want to. With that said, I'm gonna be having various depictions of drone combat that has happened mainly in the Russo-Ukrainian war over the last several years playing out behind me to hammer home just how omnipresent drone combat is now in the modern battlefield. All of this footage is meant to be shared in a informative and learning sort of way. I am not glorifying violence. I am not inciting violence and by no means am I even trying to get political with this. I mean, I've made it pretty clear where my loyalties lie. But still, at the end of the day, this is meant to be informative. Most of what we'll be going over today and most of the footage will be coming from the Russo-Ukrainian war that kicked off in earnest in February of 2022. That is what has led to the widespread adoption of drones as a form of combat, at least from what I've seen and at least in my opinion. I've followed combat footage for most of my life, especially once I enlisted in the military myself was interested in what I might be facing against if I was ever to see combat, I did not. However, I always find it very important to know what threats someone may face at any given time. So, let's start with the history of aerial warfare. World War I was when aircraft first began being used on the battlefield of its time beginning mostly with hot air balloons and dirigibles, and then slowly incorporating fixed wing aircraft in mostly a reconnaissance and spotting and artillery direction role. If you can see where your rounds are landing, if you can see where the enemy 
has all of its men and supplies set up, it makes it much easier for you to take them on. Intelligence is key. When fixed wing aircraft first started flying and being used on the skies of the modern battlefield, the pilots would, for the most part, wave and smile at each other until someone got the bright idea that, no, that's an enemy belligerent. I wonder what I could do to take them out. Pilots soon began throwing grenades at each other, leaning out the windows and firing pistols at each other, even throwing grappling hooks at each other to start trying to take the other pilots out. The first air-to-air -air kill to ever happen was between an Austrian pilot and a Russian pilot on September 8th, 1914, when a Russian pilot deliberately crashed his aircraft into an Austrian pilot and brought both planes down, killing both of the pilots. The pilots found out soon that pistols are a little inaccurate when you're flying through the air and at range, and rifles are way too bulky to keep in small aircraft cockpits. So, sure enough, they started mounting machine guns to the planes to try and take each other out. In August 23 of 1914, a British pilot opened fire with a mounted machine gun on a German pilot for the first time. And with that, the era of dogfighting was upon us, and air-to-air -air combat was underway. Shortly after all that, pilots started figuring out how to carry larger and larger explosives on their planes and carry bombs, which started off as very rudimentary. Two small bombs with a tiny peep glass to look down and try and hit your target. In a few short years, we went from carrying one or two bombs to many, and entire squadrons of bombers were sent out to essentially carpet bomb the enemy or do strategic bombing runs as they became more and more accurate. Other aircraft were invented to protect the bombers, such as fighters. Higher altitude aircraft that wouldn't be damaged by anti-aircraft guns were created so they could keep doing reconnaissance and larger and larger bombs without telling the entire history of World War I and World War II and every war that leads up to our modern era we live in. Aircraft technology progressed at an exponential rate. I have a relative that was alive to see the Wright brothers first fly and man step on the moon. Drones have a history almost as old as manned aircraft. The first drones, believe it or not, were actually used in World War I as well. They were video controlled and short range, but they were still unmanned aerial vehicles. They were a far cry from the Predator and Reaper drones that we know of today, but they were drones nonetheless. But we're not talking about those drones today. We are focused entirely today on the use of quad rotor drones. What is a quad rotor drone? Pretty simple and straightforward. It's a drone with four rotors or propellers that keep it both aloft, keep it both hovering, and allow it to have propulsion and go forward. You combine that with something like GPS or even RTK they are able to hold their position in the air very, very stable. This allows them to get great photos, fly around and be used for search and rescue missions and drop GPS coordinates. Most quad rotor drones are going to come with a battery that powers all the electronics on board, including the propellers and the gimbal. The gimbal is a stabilized camera. What the payload of that gimbal is, is gonna depend on the drone. This right here is a DJI Mavic 3T, a drone I use for search and rescue often. I've also seen this drone used many, many times on the front lines of Ukraine. In this tiny drone, I have upwards of a half hour of flight time. I have a wide view of which I can take in the world around me. I have a zoom view that can zoom in up to 56 times, and I have a forward-looking infrared thermal imaging camera, which I can use to see in the dark and pick out any source of heat. In order to fly this, the package costs around $5,000. That's a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of military industrial complex, no, it is not. Now, there are two main types of drones today that I want to talk about as it pertains to quad rotor drones, which I will be calling platform drones 
and FPV drones. I refer to these style of drones as platform drones because you can set the controller down, leave them in the air, and they will simply hover here until they run out of battery like a platform hanging in the sky. Additionally, I call them platforms because it is very easy to modify them and add anything you want, practically. This drone right here comes with a USB-C port with which to plug in anything you want to put on top of the drone, as long as it fits on the software and screws in right here. I can put a loudspeaker on top of this. I can put my RTK module on top of this for mapping my fields. I can even put a spotlight that I can then control using the drone's power from my controller. I can also very easily put on a third party attachment that allows me to carry on this model at least up to two pounds and drop it merely by activating these light sensors. Well, we'll get into that a little bit later. The other type of drone we'll be going over a lot is a first person view drone. As so, these drones are high performance, built for speed, built for acrobatics, mostly built for recreational fun. My first intro into FPV drones was watching many, many videos of people racing them and doing insane acrobatics, pulling crazy G-forces. And it was also my first foray into be using drones in combat. First video I saw of this drone in particular was of a soldier taking it off from his armored personnel carrier. He lifted the drone off of his APC, slid a pair of goggles over his eyes, and became a spotter in the sky for all of his men. That's when I knew I needed to get into drones. I had no idea you could fly drones with goggles until that video. So, the DJI FPV arrived at my house about a week later after seeing that video. Speaking of DJI, let's talk about them for a bit, since they are the global dominator when it comes to drones. Founded in 2006 by Frank Wang, a Hong Kong mainlander who had returned to China, he started DJI Dajiang Industries in his dorm room. He envisioned a world where drones helped out with everyday life. And everyone was able to get into aerial photography and videography. He had no idea about how he would revolutionize warfare. With saying that, I want to make it fully clear, I am not sponsored by DJI at all and I doubt they will probably ever sponsor me after this video. Now, DJI was one of the first manufacturers to make the use of drones widespread, but even before it was founded, drones were being used in combat. One of the early adopters of drones was actually Hezbollah, who in 2004 and 2005 used Iranian-made drones to launch scouting missions. By 2006, they figured out how to attach warheads to them and use them as poor man's cruise missiles. It only got worse from there. The first drone combat footage I ever saw was from Iraq and Syria, launched by ISIS and ISIL. They were the first videos I ever personally saw that had quad rotor drones flying and dropping small munition grenades on armored and soft targets. In 2014 and 2015 is when they really started in earnest buying DJI Phantom drones for use as reconnaissance and then retrofitting those to be used to drop munitions. The age of drone bombers was beginning. Now, you might think that drones have a high barrier to entry when it comes to flying them. And in some ways you'd be right. Flying a FPV drone on manual mode is a feat into of itself that takes several hours at least of flight simulator training if you're like me and then several more hours of flying it so that you don't crash into everything you see over and over again but with a lot of modern drones they have gps technology with which to hold themselves steady in the air bring themselves back to their launch point if they begin to run out of battery and omnidirectional sensors to keep them from crashing into stuff. So the modern drone is very, very safe to fly. And if you have any gaming experience, you could pick it up right now. These are the controllers for those two drones I just showed you. This is the FPV controller. This is the Mavic controller. The FPV controller doesn't have a screen on it because you're viewing it through your glasses. 
well, everything I need to see through the eyes of my Mavic is right in here. I have grown up doing this my entire life. Picking up this and using it for search and rescue purposes, no brainer. Now, with that experience, all I've got to do is put that drone up in the air, get somewhere safe, hand me a radio, and I can easily be guiding artillery strikes in on an enemy force. I don't have to put on camouflage or a ghillie suit and crawl up to the front and hope I don't get seen. I just sit in my hole and put this up from several hundred feet up in the air, practically invisible, and call in strikes for my team. Now, you might be thinking, that's fine and dandy at all, but it's obviously got to take a lot longer to become a bomber, correct? You'd be wrong. Now, I wish I could explain exactly how these are created, but the last thing I want is for YouTube to think I'm trying to show how to make weapons or for nice men in nice suits and jackets to show up at my house and knock on the door and say, please come with us, because I'm only trying to bring awareness to something that the world and our nation needs to grapple with, which is the threat of how easy it is to turn recreational drones into weapons of war with easily accessible parts legally bought online that I use for good, but can be equally used for evil. Now, before you start freaking out wondering why I have these, I use these for carrying search and rescue equipment. I can transport a two pound medical bag with my larger drone, my Matrice class drone. I can transport a one pound medical kit with my Mavic. And my Mini 3 can carry about a half a pound. That's potential life-saving equipment. I'm also able to control the spotlight attachment with my Mavic using all of this equipment, which I have used to save someone's life. We're using this for good, but there's always gonna be bad that comes with it. Now, you might be thinking this is not much of a comparison to a hand grenade, and I can tell you right now, you'd be wrong. M67 grenade fits in the palm of your hand. It was designed to be thrown like a baseball. It weighs 14 ounces. The VOG grenades that I see dropped from a lot of the drones in Ukraine weigh a lot less than that. The larger the drone, the larger the explosive they can carry too. Now, drone warfare has existed for quite some time, but as mentioned before, has really risen to prominence with the Russian Ukrainian war. So let's start at the beginning of that. Andriy Pokrasa, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right. The 15 year old boy who, when Russia invaded in February of 2022, launched his small drone into the air and began running down and sending the coordinates of armor, tanks, and vehicles rolling in that artillery strikes would then land upon. He was one of the first real combatants that I know of to be using drones for a first world artillery strike. During the very early days of the war, most of the footage I saw and what everyone else saw was drones being used for this task, being used to narrow down artillery strikes and find out where large swaths of armor and personnel and vehicles were. And then very quickly, you started seeing drones being dropped using skyhooks. Many different types of munitions have been dropped from drones. So let's go over those really quickly. The most commonly known munition is most likely the fragmentation explosive, which generally consists of an explosive charge surrounded by metal. When the explosive goes off, it fragments its case and turns all of its casing into shrapnel that then flies out in a sphere or circle, piercing flesh and clothing as it goes. It's very simple to create, very simple to set off, and has good effect. Another type of lesser known munition that has seen a lot of use in this war is the thermobaric grenade. Thermo standing for heat, baric standing for pressure, which explodes using a fuel and air mixture to essentially crush anything in its explosive path. 
reliant more on the overpressurization instead of the shrapnel to do its work. This is highly effective for taking out small confined spaces where shrapnel might get caught up in the dirt or the walls. The pressure is just air. It's going to go where it's going to go. An even more deadlier version of the shrapnel or fragmentation is the air burst, which instead of impacting and hitting and then exploding is detonated remotely. Imagine a flying claymore mine, if you will, or a giant shotgun shell is probably a better way of explaining it. The charge explodes and sends all of its shrapnel forward, which makes it great for pinpoint accuracy and ensures that none of the shrapnel or fragmentation kinetic energy is lost in the dirt when it hits. It's something I've been seeing more and more and more recently attached to FPV drones to, again, deadly effect. A kind of cousin to the air burst charge is going to be your shaped charge, more colloquially known as high explosive anti-tank or heat. There's several different variations of this, but they all have the same mechanism of action. Shaped charges are hollow cones of generally copper that are surrounded by explosives, which when that explosive is detonated, it crushes that copper in on itself and turns it into a hypersonic jet of plasma, which will flow through metal like water. You send this hyper speed, hyper heated jet of liquid metal through tank armor and you puncture one munition, there's a good chance you're going to set off the entire magazine. Shape charges require standoff distance, meaning distance between the explosive and its target in order to form their shape, which is why you see them most commonly used on FPV kamikaze drones, which we will get to in a second. Now, you might be thinking with all of these explosives and talk of kamikaze drones, you might be thinking why not just attach firearms to drones? And I have seen it. I have not seen them used. Firearms, especially large caliber firearms, produce a lot of recoil. You'll watch Kentucky Ballistics and see how much recoil some guns can produce. You start adding recoil into flying gyroscopic stabilized drones, there's a good chance you're going to overload the system on how much it can handle and send your drone toppling towards the ground. Imagine just a small 1911 under this. You fire it, that recoil is going to go completely into this drone. Most of the recoil from your weapons that you may fire, such as a pistol or a shotgun or rifle, is absorbed either by your shoulder or your wrist. Both of those can still be pretty uncomfortable. You put that on a small drone like this and you fire it, that drone's going to go like this very easily. Until we figure out how to solve the issue of recoil dampening on drones without adding far too much weight and causing them to fall out of the sky, not sure how many firearms we're going to be seeing on drones. You got f***ing kidding me. So let's go over the type of drones that we're seeing mainly in combat. We have spotter drones, which are used to fly above the battlefield and just observe, just watch for anything that might be incoming. They're also used for guiding artillery in or providing overwatch for infantry. They generally have a wide and zoom view on them. They have the ability to drop GPS coordinates underneath them. And then some in the Matrix or Matrice class of drones have laser rangefinders that can be used to figure out the distance to a target within a certain range, as well as drop GPS pins down wherever the laser rangefinder is pointing. Then we have bomber drones, which are essentially converted quad rotor drones from a spotter roll to a bombing roll. These are drones that have a skyhook either third-party attachment or something built into them that will allow the drone to carry a cargo of munitions and fly it over to drop it 
the skill of drone operators has become scarily accurate over the last two years. Now, bombing drones are not just being used for dealing death. I've seen several different instances where bomber drones are used to drop letters of surrender. They're able to drop information to bring an enemy to a different trench to have him surrender, lead them away from the battlefield. They're also a great way to resupply, dropping off food, water, ammunition, heating supplies, communication equipment, you name it. That's what I use mine for. Not magazines, California, calm down. But food and water and medical supplies. Probably the last version of the platform style drones will be the infrared drones. Most, most drones purchased on the civilian market do not come with an infrared camera. They are meant to put up in the air and get some cool photos to show your friends and family back home, maybe make a YouTube video or two. But the infrared is really only used for firefighting and search and rescue and military purposes. Having an infrared sensor on your drone, which allows you to see at night, it opens up everything. It used to be, back in older days, night was your friend. You could hide. With infrared, there is no hiding. This is what it looks like when I'm flying my drone at night without using the infrared. And this is what it looks like under infrared. I can see everything. If there is a shred of heat somewhere out there that is not obscured or undercover, I'm going to find it. Now, on the FPV style of drones, okay. most FPV drones that are being used in huh? modern warfare are not DJI. They're actually home built. All of the things you need to know to build your own FPV drone are easily accessible on the internet. FPV drones were not started by DJI. They were home built using soldering tools and easily accessible parts. And since home built FPV drones do not have GPS added on to them, unless you really wanted to try and put one on and program it yourself, they can't be geofenced. So, hooray. They're piloted by soldiers wearing special goggles that allow them to see everything that's happening through the drone in real time. I've alluded it to like flying your own roller coaster. It is hard to beat. It's some of the most fun I ever have. It's something I look forward to going and doing constantly without the added addition of crashing it, which is what these pilots are trained to do. You fly this drone forward and your munitions complete a circuit or set off the warhead, which causes the drone to explode. There's a couple other different variations as well. There's the anti-tank kamikaze drones, which, as mentioned before, have a high explosive anti-tank warhead attached to them. When it comes to the anti-tank kamikaze drones, pilots are mainly aiming towards the magazine where all of the shells for the tank are stored, or aiming towards the engine block. These high explosive anti-tank rounds are proving terrifyingly useful. They're not just used against tanks, they're used against all sorts of infantry fighting vehicles, armored personnel carriers, you name it. Anti-personnel kamikaze drones are kind of of the same class as the anti-tank drones, except as we spoke earlier, they have fragmentation explosives on them that when they hit, they detonate into a sphere of flying shrapnel everywhere. This essentially allows anyone with one of these drones to fly it, and instead of firing it like you would an artillery shell where you fire it and hope it hits when it comes to most dumb munitions, or a rocket launcher where you fire it and it's gonna follow a straight path out, you're able to fire it, miss your target, do 180 degrees on a dime, and come back down and crash. As I mentioned before, if I can fly manual mode, anyone can. I'm a 32 year old, my hand-eye coordination starting to go, and I can surf canyons. So imagine what someone younger than me trained to do this all day, every day could become. One of the types of kamikaze drones that I've been seeing more and more recently over the past couple of weeks is airburst kamikaze drones, which are essentially 
the same sort of thing as anti-personnel drones, but again, all of that shrapnel is angled forward. There's no sphere, there's no hitting it and it going out like this. It's pointing towards you and it's firing a giant shotgun shell. Even more interesting that I've seen recently is FPV drones with thermal imaging cameras on them. They are being used to terrifying effect once again because you'll be walking through the forest and suddenly, without you even knowing, there is a tiny little missile piloted by someone who doesn't like you headed your direction and you'll never know until it's too late. So those are the two main drones that I've been seeing in combat. Let's go over some honorable mentions. I've seen a couple of drones be used for retrieval on the battlefield where they've been able to go out and retrieve radios, get your communications secured, get your enemy's communications. They've been used to retrieve drones. All of these drones have crucial information on them that I would not want getting into my enemy's hands. SD cards, they have GPS coordinates from where they took off, and they can always be repaired. So bringing your dead robotic soldiers back from the battlefield is becoming quite important. Another type of FPV combat drone that I've been seeing is the dive bomber FPV, which is somewhere in between the anti-personnel kamikaze drone and the airburst drone, where it takes a lot of skill to use, but at least you get your drone back. They're using the drones to dive towards an enemy trench and release their cargo instead of crashing into the ground or detonating the drone for the airburst with it, which anything you can reuse more than once, perfect. You're keeping down the rate of attrition but it seems it's not being adopted as much as I would have expected. Another honorable mention is the gunship drone, of which I've seen a few floating around, but again, I've never yet to see them work. I've seen them attached with AT-4 missile launchers, with uh, Dishka machine guns, you name it. When I see them fix the recoil on it, we'll talk about it a bit more. Another interesting bit I've seen kind of starting to take place with FPV drones is the use of machine learning or AI. Electronic warfare is a real thing. When your signal gets jammed, your drone could be dead in the air. So being able to select a target and tell your drone to autonomously fly towards it is great for everyone except humanity because holy smokes, how do we put that one back in Pandora's box when we're able to tell machines, go that way, press a button, and let it figure out the rest? I've only seen it once or twice so far, but it was scary enough to want to mention it. Another way of using drones that I haven't seen so much in the Russo-Ukrainian war, but more so in the other major conflict that has started recently, namely the one that started in October of 2023, is using drones to clear houses. So for that, I've been seeing soldiers using the DJI Avada, which I have and love. It's another FPV drone, uses the same goggles, same controller. It's a lot smaller and all of the propellers are protected. You can crash this thing into the wall. It'll keep on flying. You can actually get it to return and flip back over on itself with the push of a button on your goggles. My last Avada before this one, I actually crashed into a concrete wall and fell into some tepid water where it sat for 20 minutes and it flew perfectly for many, many hours afterwards until I ran it into some more concrete and finally did enough damage to it where I decided I'll send it in. So something like this is perfect if you're trying to clear houses in either a combat application or law enforcement. I haven't tried it with fire department yet because I'm not about fly this into a burning house when I would be better suited to be working the engine. But I have seen it used that way, and I guarantee you're going to start seeing more drones like this being used to clear houses. All it takes is one person trained on this. I have a 3D printed attachment, mounts right on top of the drone, has two front facing headlights for clearing dark rooms. It's a very useful tool that I guarantee you're going to be seeing more on the battlefield and more for law enforcement. So how are drones affecting the modern battlefield outside of the ways we've already discussed? Being able to guide your munitions by hand directly into an enemy vehicle or group of personnel for cheap is huge, 
especially when it comes to attrition, when it comes to money and resources and people, being able to keep costs low is a really big deal. So being able to fly an FPV kamikaze drone that costs maybe 1200 bucks into a several million dollar piece of equipment, or at least several hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of piece of equipment and have it be gone, hard to beat that. So a lot of people are starting to think, what do we do when it comes to armored personnel carriers or infantry fighting vehicles or even of armored tanks? How do we protect against these? There's ways of protecting them, such as the trophy system used by the IDF, but that's dangerous if you want to have your infantry protecting your vehicle. Another way that drones are really affecting the modern battlefield is being able to have that eye in the sky with the high ground looking out with thermal vision. Even if enemy personnel are maintaining light discipline, maintaining heat discipline, all it takes is for someone to not be undercover or very good concealment and a thermal drone is going to spot them. You're not able to hide at night anymore. Speaking of hiding, it used to be you were relatively safe if you had a foxhole or a trench to hide in. Get underneath the cover and the enemy bullets won't hit you. Unless you're really, really unlucky, that artillery shell will hit above or below your trench. That's why they make trenches in zigzag formation. So even if that shell lands in your trench, hopefully most of the shrapnel gets dispersed among the dirt. Can't do that as much with the use of drones. Considering now, all it takes is a skilled operator to fly above your trench or foxhole in 1001, 1002, and next thing you know, there's a grenade in your lap. So not only does it feel like you're not safe anymore in your armored vehicle that could be hit by a, an explosive anti-tank round on four little rotors, or you're not safe walking on the road a ways out from where you know the enemy is because you're either gonna get spotted by artillery or a FPV anti-personnel drone is gonna come to get you or a drone's gonna fly over and drop a grenade on your feet. You're not safe in your trench or your foxhole either because the enemy can just fly above it, look down on you and drop the grenade right into your trench or foxhole and record it all in Ultra HD. The other major factor that is talked about a lot is the psychological aspect of drones. Each drone has a very, very distinct sound and all of them sound angry from the deep throated whine of the matrix blades to the high pitched scream of FPV drones incoming. It's a very distinct and inhuman sound that I think we're gonna be dealing with a lot of PTSD from for the major foreseeable future. So what are some drone weaknesses? The main weakness is probably going to be the radio control. Once you get past a certain distance, you get a certain amount of trees or mountains and things away, it can become pretty hard to see through the drone and even at times correct course which is why a lot of drones have the built-in return to home RTH feature, which allows them to fly right back to where they launched from, which is not always great because when it comes to combat scenarios, you don't want to lead the enemy right back to your position. Another major weakness, as we talked about earlier, is the propellers. You take out one propeller on a drone, it's gonna come out of the sky. They need all four blades turning in order to maintain proper balance. As seen here in what I believe is the first recorded drone to drone, air to air kill, all it takes is essentially tapping the top of a drone propeller and it goes hurtling towards the ground. I'm very interested to see where drone air to air combat goes. Just hopefully it doesn't happen above me. A couple other weaknesses is being able to spot the drones. The larger the drone is, the more audible report it's gonna give off, the easier it's gonna be able to be seen in the air, but even at 400 feet, it's very, very hard to spot a Mavic. And if you're flying any higher than that, like you can in an active war zone, it's gonna become even harder and harder to spot those. So that's why listening and hearing that distinctive whine of the propellers is going to be huge for detecting your drones and defending against them 
which is not easy to do when you have artillery rounds going off around you, incoming and outgoing, and you're firing your rifle several times a day. Another good way to defend against it is to use your two Cs, cover and concealment. Conceal yourself so you can't get spotted, but doing it in such a way so that the drone operator doesn't look down and go, huh, that looks a little suspicious right there. What's that? Let's get a better look in. So when you're concealing yourself, you have to be mindful of concealing yourself horizontally, so that way any enemy infantry can't see you, as well as vertically, so the enemy drone can't see you. And doing it in such a way that you don't immediately give off your position from the air, because I know as a drone pilot myself, I'm constantly looking for stuff that's out of place, because that's generally how I find people. Another way to defend against it is to get your other C, which is cover, where you're not going to have something dropped on you, or you're not going to get hit by bullets. And pray that a FPV kamikaze drone with a thermobaric grenade doesn't decide to come and delete your cover. Good luck. There are different types of firearms that are being tested against drones as well. We did a video recently where we tested various shotguns against drone targets. Yes, it was clickbait. If you can get the FAA to allow me to shoot drones in my backyard, I will happily redo that test. But until then, I'm not staking the license I use for farming and firefighting and search and rescue on a YouTube video. I've heard and seen instances of drones being dropped by rifles and mainly shotguns, as long as they're within close range, but they're still pretty hard to hit. Um, I've seen way more videos of guys shooting at drones than I have of drones actually being shot. So take with that what you will. Another way of taking down drones that I'll probably, you'll probably see more around embassies and forward operating bases is turrets. Uh, turrets such as the CRAM, counter rocket artillery and mortar weapons, which they are the essentially Gatling guns that fire into the air, a stream of self-exploding bullets that they're hoping to take out incoming fire with shrapnel. Another air defense you might see is outgoing missiles such as the Iron Dome or Patriot air battery systems, which are very expensive to fire and are really only used for larger targets that are incoming, which we will be doing a video on larger drones soon. The final turret that I could really think of that might be put to use, which I've seen is just beginning to be tested, is something like a point defense laser system, such as the Dragonfire laser from the UK, which uses light to superheat the casing of an incoming artillery round, mortar round, rocket round, or drone to boil the electronics alive or cause the munition itself to explode. The cost of using the laser, probably not that much as compared to firing a large missile at it or firing a huge burst of exploding shells at it. But the setup and creation of a laser large enough to automatically track and take out incoming drones. I don't even want to think about how much that costs. Is it worth it in the terms of human lives saved? Absolutely, but we can't be setting one of those up in every city around the world. Another way of simply denying drones the ability to fly is geofencing, which if you have a DJI drone, you should know well about. There are certain areas you cannot take off and fly through that is easily spoofed. How do you think all the DJI drones are being used in the Russo-Ukrainian war? You think DJI really enjoys being the poster boy of this war? I doubt it. I know they've done everything in their power to keep their drones from flying there. And all it takes is people who know how to write a little bit of code. That's all it takes. Another way of taking out drones is electronic warfare, which I am too dumb to understand, which essentially just blocks the radio signals between the drone and the operator. That's a layman's explanation, but it forces the drone to land in some cases or just holds it there so it doesn't know how to return home. It's jamming. It's expensive to create and becomes a huge target for anyone who doesn't want their drones jammed. Now, I've had a lot of doom and gloom with this whole conversation, so I want to talk about a few things that drones are being used for for good, not just by me, but fellow drone pilots the world round. First one, search and rescue. Within seconds, I'm able to pull up my backpack and have a wide zoom and thermal eye into sky 
to help find missing and lost people and return them back to their family. That's huge. Another example, firefighting. I've used my drones multiple times to check on fires before our engines could even get there, to give a thermal heat analysis of a structure fire or a vegetation fire to the on-scene commander and give them a better idea of what this fire is going to do to help protect property and lives. Law enforcement. There's some programs going on right now where before they even dispatch a ground officer out there, they're sending drones out to find out what is going on. Being able to get those eyes on a scene in seconds is huge. Being able to track escaped felons through the woods without endangering officers having to walk through the woods by themselves or with their dogs in the middle of the night. Instead, being able to put a spotlight and speaker attachment on a drone and fly it out and spotlight the subject that you find on thermal and order him to get on the ground. Again, saving lives, protecting the public. Farming, that's how I really got into drones too. Using my drones to fly around and check my rice fields, to map out my crops. I map out my almond orchards every single year to see how the bloom is doing. There's even drones that are being used for spraying fields that alleviates the pressure on crop dusters having to fly over with a helicopter or an airplane, putting themselves in danger. Deliveries. We've all heard of Amazon hoping to get drone deliveries going on here soon, and I'm a huge fan of it. We just gotta figure out the different flight routes for them and go right ahead. Think of how much your typical Amazon worker has to drive per day to get out to you. How many emissions are we saving by having drones flying instead? Watch one of Mark Rober's video from last year where they talk about how they're using drones, not quad rotors, but they're using drones to deliver medicine and supplies all around Rwanda. I'm able to deliver stuff with my drone. If someone's out in the middle of a field and they need a tool delivered to them, I can happily take it out there to them. Working on the parachute design for air dropping medical supplies is something I'm hoping to do here soon. So that way I can get that out to everyone to hopefully help out people in distress. Recreation, being able to put a drone in the air and get some beautiful photos and videos of things that until recently, only people with an airplane or helicopter could really get is grand. I love just taking photos and videos of the landscape as I'm out walking around on the hikes. And then FPV racing is something I wish I was a little bit better at so I can try it myself because it looks like a lot of fun. But again, recreation. All those are just a few of the good things that drones are being used for. What does drone warfare hold for the future? I think we'll save for another video. I have a lot of predictions and a lot of thoughts, a lot of voices that I've heard saying where they think drones will go. This video is already getting a little long, so I think I'll save my predictions for the future of drone warfare and drone usage and drone licenses for another video. Drones are here to stay. Pandora's box has been opened and the militaries of the world have seen what a first multiplier they are. I don't know how we rein this in. I don't know how we go back to the way things were before, not like any things were better, but drone combat is something that's only going to become more and more mainstream and normalized. And I just hope we don't see it come home anytime soon. Тихо, 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 братан! Hopefully.